If you're an aspiring cinematographer like I am, you'll probably be worried about some of these things. What lights are you going to use? Is it a set of brand new LEDs or the most powerful HMI? What camera will you be shooting on? Are you Alexa, Faricam, Red Epic? Or maybe what lenses you'll be using, be it super speeds, ultra primes or cine zooms? In all this techno mumble jumble, all the important things like composition and motivation take a backseat. This is something I see more and more in aspiring cinematographers. They forget that as a cinematographer, you have to own the image and the technicalities, from composition to lighting techniques and lens choices. Which is why I'll be talking about the master cinematographer, John Alcott, who did just that. John Alcott's film career began in 1948, when he was just 17 years old. He worked on sets as a lowly clapper loader, basically the equivalent of a cleaner in the camera department, you know what I'm saying? Jokes aside, he would go on to become a focus puller after 7 years of being a slave, I, I mean a clapper loader. It was in that position where he would meet another wise master DP, Geoffrey Answorth, where he would continue to work under Answorth for over 15 films, until a little film called 2001 A Space Odyssey came about. It was here where Alcott had his big break, except it wasn't really big, it was more of like, out of this world, huh? get it, get it, never mind. You see, the director of this film was quite a big deal. Or as we like to put it in Singapore, a toa sai. His name was Stanley Kubrick, and he was the master of masters. So what happened was that Geoffrey Unsworth had to leave 2001 during the production, as he had other commitments to attend to, which lucky for Johnny Boy gave him an opportunity to replace him in the Dawn of Man sequence of the film. This led to the creation of the director DP equivalent of peanut butter and jelly, Kubrick and Alcott. Even though John Alcott himself says that he never imagined himself being a cinematographer, Together, Kubrick and Alcott would go on to make masterpieces like A Clockwork Orange, The Shining, and Barry Lyndon. Launching Alcott's career into master DP status and getting him an Oscar for Best Cinematography in the process. In fact, John Alcott himself has admitted that he owes his career as a cinematographer to Stanley Kubrick. But don't get me wrong here, Alcott is a master at his craft even without Kubrick. He had an extreme knowledge of different types of film stock and lighting techniques. He was also a humble man as described by those who worked with him. No, he's very soft, very sensitive, very uh, soft-spoken, very gentle, very quiet. Sadly, Kubrick didn't churn out films very fast, so Alcott worked on a lot more obscure projects to keep him going. Some of these you probably never even heard of, but they are still an excellent example of his work. Some of these films include The Beastmaster, Terror Train, and Vice Squad. John Alcott would continue to work as a cinematographer until he died of a heart attack in 1986, after finishing his work on his last film, White Water Summer. But even after his death, his legacy still lives on, so much so that Ari created an award named after him, named the John Alcott Ari Award. And the film No Way Out was dedicated to him. Now that I've covered his backstory, I'll move on to the techniques that he used. During my research, I was really surprised to find out that the techniques that he used were very unorthodox and strange even in today's standards. Even though extravagant lighting is common in Hollywood, John Alcott was very well known for his naturalist style instead, which was very prevalent in the films that he made. He admits it himself in the documentary Six Kinds of Light. He believed in keeping the light as natural as possible, often relying on sunlight. He would even study sunlight so he could recreate it himself. It is a common sight in his films to see blown out windows in the frame, acting as a light source for the scene. Often he would layer the windows with diffusion, anti-gels or even tracing paper so he could pump a light through the window, often using lights like mini brutes, maxi brutes, lower lamps and HMIs. Practical lights was another technique that he used excessively. There would always be a motivation for where the light was coming from, be it a lamp, fluorescent tube or even candle light. He would pay extreme attention to where and how he placed his practicals. When he worked on The Shining, he had each practical installed with dimmers and wired into the set two months prior to shooting, giving him as much control over the light as he could get. Even if he didn't have natural light or he couldn't control the practical lights, he would make use of the available light to make it work. You can see this in his work on Vice Squad. He had to light a street at night and instead of using a generator and huge lights like most cinematographers, he opted to work with the available light instead, using fast lenses and film stock. He even wet the entire street so he could bring his exposure up by bouncing light off the floor. It wasn't just lighting that was Alcott's strong point, he also had a vast knowledge of film stock. 
You can see this in the consistency of his works. He could even keep the contrast ratio he wanted consistent even when shooting in daylight. To pull off something like this would mean that he had to know the film he was shooting on extremely well and he definitely did. Now one can't talk about John Alcott without mentioning Barry Lyndon. The reason I'm dedicating one entire part of my video to Barry Lyndon is that it really is John Alcott's most remarkable work. If I could only choose one of Alcott's work to analyse, Barry Lyndon would be it. Alcott and Kubrick wanted to make the film look as realistic as possible, which meant that all of Barry Lyndon's night scenes were lit with candlelight. Yes, you heard it right, candlelight. Anyone who's ever attempted cinematography will know that this is nuts. I mean, by today's standards, it wouldn't be as crazy. Just, I mean, just grab an A7S and bump up the ISO, right? Alright, oh, this is the 70s and everything was shot on film stock. Now do you see how crazy this is? Okay, moving on from that, let me tell you how he did that. He used an extremely rare lens made for NASA. Yeah, those guys that go into space. Anyways, the lens was used on the Apollo moon landings and it was a Zeiss F0.7 50mm lens. Alcott would use this huge aperture to let in as much light as possible. But then there was a the problem of pulling focus at f0.7, which meant that every movement had to be extremely precise and actors had virtually no moving space at all. You can see here from this clip how little of the actor's face is actually in focus, which goes to show how shallow the depth of field was. So yes, it was really, really, really hard, but the results are more than worth it as the candlelit scenes have an authenticity that can never be recreated with any other light sources. But it wasn't just the technicalities that were remarkable on Barry Lyndon. John Alcott worked extensively to recreate the 18th century look on the film. Even when it wasn't lit with candlelight, the lighting on Barry Lyndon is still phenomenal as John Alcott's extensive study of daylight let him recreate natural daylight perfectly. You can see it from the shots where daylight just pours through the windows and it looks amazing. He even went so far as to study the work of famous painters. He went into English, Dutch and French painters like Thomas Gainsborough, Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot and Jean Vautil. Using these paintings as a reference for how he wanted Barry Lyndon to look. All this led to the film looking like a painting brought to life, exactly what Kubrick and Alcott set out to achieve, which is remarkable. To conclude, John Alcott represents a very rare breed of cinematographers who have a perfect balance of technical and artistic skill. His naturalist style and attention to details are traits that every cinematographer should learn from. John Alcott may not be with us anymore, but his work and impact will live on forever, continuing to inspire people like myself.